uh, what are the top three public policy concerns for women, uh, especially in the region? So we are talking about Asia and the Pacific. And to answer and provide some insights on this question, we have three very esteemed panelists uh, with us. And I will take some time uh, to briefly introduce each one of them. And once I've introduced, I'll also sort of set up what the, the structure of today's panel uh, is supposed to be. Uh, so first we have uh, Senator Linda Reynolds, uh, who's Senator for West Western Australia. Uh, Senator Reynolds was elected to the Australian Senate in 2014, and she's a passionate representative for Western Australia. She has over 20 years experience at the national political level working for ministers, members of parliament and the Liberal Party of Australia. Uh, Senator Reynolds served for 29 years in the Australian Army uh, as a reserve officer. She also has corporate experience. In terms of her career appointments, they include Chief of Staff uh, to the Minister for Justice and Customs, Project Director with Raytheon, uh, Raytheon Australia, Deputy Federal Director of the Liberal Party of Australia, Commanding Officer of a Combat Service Support Battalion, and Adjutant General of Army. Uh, the Chief of Army's key governance advisor. Uh, she was the first woman in the Australian Army Reserves to be promoted to the rank of Brigadier and was awarded the Conspicuous Service Cross. Awesome. <laughs> uh, she is a member of 10 parliamentary committees and is also chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, the Senate Standing Committee on Education and Employment, the Defence Subcommittee and the Senate Publication Committee. She also chairs the Australia-Indonesia Parliamentary Friendship Group, uh, and she is pursuing new defence industry opportunities in Western Australia, innovation, gender equality, and federation reform. So that is just first of our panellists. So we are still, still to go through uh, two other very esteemed panellists. Then we have uh, Honourable Dr. Deepu Moni, who was the first female foreign minister and member of parliament uh, of Bangladesh. Um, first woman. Yeah. She is chairperson of the Parliamentary Standing Committee in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, chairperson of all party parliamentary group on human rights, former foreign minister, which was from 2009 until 2013, Government of the People's Republic of uh, Bangladesh. Uh, she is also currently Joint Secretary of the Awami League. Before her induction to the cabinet, Dr. Deepu Moni was Secretary for Women's Affairs and a member of the Subcommittee for Foreign Affairs of the Bangladesh Awami League. She is a qualified physician and draws upon advanced qualifications in public health and law and is an advocate of the Bangladesh Supreme Court. She is an avid protagonist of representative politics and women's participation in political decision-making process. She's one of the two master trainers for women political activists in her party. She has also worked closely with the National Democratic Institute of the United States to develop a training program for female political activists. The principal focus of her work has been women's rights and entitlements, health legislation, health policy and management, health financing, strategic planning, and health and human rights under the constitution and law in the Bangladesh uh, economic and social development programs, and also foreign policy issues of the region as well as globally. And our last esteemed panelist is Representative Emmy De Jesus, who is president of the Gabriela Women's Party, and she's the congresswoman uh, of the Philippines. She is on her third term as GWP representative in the Philippine Congress. She's an active forwarding, she's active in forwarding legislative measures aimed at pushing a pro-poor, pro-woman and patriotic agenda. She was a student activist during her stay in the University of the Philippines where she took up her bachelor's in physics. She has been an advocate of women's rights for more than three decades. She was one of the founding members of Gabriela Alliance established in 1984 and the Gabriela Women's Party List founded in 2000. Her experiences in organizing women of various sectors strengthened her advocacies, which she carries in her work as a legislator. She believes in the fight for women's emancipation from oppression and exploitation, and uh, she believes that they must be sustained, uh, it must be um, 
prevented inside and outside of the parliament. So these are our three very, very esteemed panelists. So I, I feel very small in, uh, in what my achievements have been. Um, so very quickly, uh, I'm assistant professor here at the Lee Kuan Yew School. Um, academically, I do a lot of work on gender and development. So this is uh, obviously of great interest to me. Um, and we will kick off the discussion, giving 10 minutes to each of our panelists, starting uh, with Senator Linda Reynolds. And after that, we will open up the floor for Q&A. So the, the format would be similar where we give each of the panelists an opportunity to respond, unless there are, of course, specific questions for uh, a particular panelist. And just one request uh, for the panelists to use the uh, mics uh, that have been provided. And to the audience, if you have a question, please press the button of the microphones that are in front of you when you want to ask a question so that everyone can hear you. So over to you, Linda. What I thought I'd focus on a little bit is the uh, this week, uh, the World Economic Forum re released their latest uh, global gender gap report. And it actually showed that for the first time in 10 years, the indices are going backwards, not forwards. And so I want to pick a little bit of, of up, and maybe in the discussions, some of the reasons why that's happening. But according to current trends, the overall global gender gap across the four major indices will not be closed for 100 years. And in fact, that's up from 83 years just last year. So that what that shows is that inaction, or even if you're just standing still, you're going behind. So Australia ranks 35th out of 144 countries that are measured. And we do very well in health and education, but we lag on economic parity and political empowerment, which are the things that I wanted to talk about today. And uh, Singapore uh, ranks 65th, but it has very similar profile on the indices in health and education than Australia does. But there is some, in, in, in that report, there is some uh, shining, some light, is that globally the education gap is closing fast. And on current trends, that'll actually be closed in 13 years, which is actually very good news. But as I said, Australia has closed the education gap, as has Singapore, to the point that girls on average now in Australia end up with higher results all the way through from primary school to university. And their health outcomes are now the same as our boys. So they have the same start to life now as boys, but what you, we have not yet achieved is the same economic uh, parity and also political parity as, uh, as men. And... They are the biggest challenges, and I want to unpack those a little bit uh, today. But for a number of reasons, economic parity and political equality and enfranchisement are much harder to achieve than health and education outcomes. I think it's because economics and politics are actually about power. Who has it? Who wants it? And how we share it. I mean, that's what democracy is about, is how we, we share power amongst the, amongst the many. And it's the same dynamics whether it's in parliament, in community groups, uh, in family groups, in bureaucracies. And those who have the economic power and the political power rarely voluntarily relinquish it, either consciously or unconsciously. So I think equity arguments, which are much easier uh, to, to sell in the community for health and education, they're easier to sell and easier to implement. And if we're going to change it, I think we need to start changing uh, the debate about this away from it as being a women's issue or a community issue to an economic issue. And that there are benefits for men, just as many benefits for men as there are for women, to have more economic uh, and political parity. So today I want to focus on three barriers, I, th I think, that are three of the biggest barriers we face I in Australia today. The first one is the universal problem, and that is physical security and abuse. Uh, Australia is no different, I think, from most other countries. And just to give you some idea of the statistics, uh, one Australian woman is killed every week by a current or former partner. One in three women have experienced physical and sexual violence by somebody known to them. We all know the devastation that causes not only in the women but on their families. And it's the principal cause still of homelessness in Australia for women and for their children. And the prospects of poverty and financial hardship can also be the cause of women staying in or returning to abusive relationships. 
But in Australia, for all too long, until the last few years, this has been a problem which I would say is hidden in plain sight. People want to ignore it, they don't want to acknowledge it, and it's a women's, you know, it's a women's problem. But for reasons I won't go into now, but I'm happy to discuss them, we, that is changing very much in Australia. We have now, uh, we are now publicising it, bringing it out of the dark, talking about it, not just as a, as a women or a man's, you know, private business, um, but bringing it into light to, to address it. Because without physical security, there can be no economic security or political empowerment. So that's the first one. The second one is economic security. And again, without economic security, there will never be full parity. And women, just as men, when they finish, graduate from um, university, they have to be able to provide equally for their own families as men can. An interesting thing in Australia is while we have closed the education gap, we are a long way from uh, closing the economic gap. So our challenge at the moment is to address reasons why women's economic parity declines so sharply once women enter the workforce. So today, Australian female employment is at a record high of 5.7 million women. But the gender pay gap is still at 17, in fact, nearly 18%, or just under $300 a week. Therefore, the majority of women uh, retire with nearly $100,000 less superannuation and are much more likely to be in poverty uh, on retirement. But on the upside, 58% of uh, university <coughs> graduates, particularly in the professions, are now women. However, their average starting salaries is still two to three thousand dollars less than the same male graduate going into the same sorts of jobs. And from that position, when they graduate, women's exponentially their outcomes in leadership and pay uh, get get exponentially worse until just ten percent of women reach executive levels, and only two percent become CEOs. So you can see where the pay gap uh, balloons out and some of the problems. Now, the Australian government has recognised this and has got a number of measures to address this, which is good, but again, it's not something that government alone can do. It is a societal and an organisational issue. Now, the third issue of particular uh, interest to me and I think uh, relevance to Australia is what I call the, equality, uh, or the inequality of opportunity in the workplace itself. And this is a, a result, I believe, of workplaces. So while we've educated our girls to the point where they're actually now outperforming a lot of young men, they get to the workplace and things, you know, the workplace is not ready for women. They're still structured quite often for men who traditionally have had wives at home to look after their families and to do, to do all of that work. But the reality is today that most children, certainly in Australia, have two working parents and the overwhelming burden uh, of looking after family, house and children and career rests with women. So for me, this is not a gender issue just for women because men need to be supported at work, encouraged culturally and organisationally <coughs> to share the financial burdens, to share the child rearing responsibilities and also to take the same hit as women do when they have to leave work for, for for family occurrences. Some, some places are doing that very well. In Scandinavia, you know, men have to t are legally obliged to take the same time off as women do to look after their children. Um, but I think in Australia, we're still a little way away, away from that. The other thing about equality of opportunity in the workplace uh, relates to the type of education women are getting. In Australia, 75% of the jobs uh, now demand digital literacy and STEM qualifications, uh, but only 20% of our students are graduating with those qualifications, and less than 15% of those are women. So that is also a significant challenge that we now need to overcome. Again, we've got some programs, but it's going to take uh, some time. So in conclusion, I think the barriers that face women are absolutely universal. In some nations, and in some nations with some of my colleagues here in the Parliamentary Caucus, the challenge might still be for young girls to survive infancy, to, to be fed enough, to receive proper health care, uh, to be educated and not to be married, uh, you know, in their, in their t early teens. But still, so that's the, that's the issue many countries face. But for us, it's now an issue, the harder issue, or well, just as hard if not harder, than providing full equality and equity in economic empowerment and also political empowerment. My political party, sadly, we've still got 20% female representation. 
and uh, that is in no way reflecting uh, the Australian society today. So I think that it will take great and sustained leadership to realise the social and organisational changes required to rebalance the power relationships in the workplace, in the home, in the communities and also in our parliament. And I think the cost of doing nothing, I think we can see because we've gone backwards this year, um, we can't just hope for it to happen or just tread water. We've actually got to do a lot more than that because otherwise young girls of today will not ever have the same opportunity as their brothers do. So thank you. We are here as part of a historic process to create new frontiers. Uh, frontiers for us, women, indeed for all of mankind, of vision, of entitlements, and of their realization. We have made enormous strides. Those here wield legislative authority. Some contribute to the important discourse on policy and how this may be done. Some of us have had the opportunity to make critical decisions for society and state. Some will no doubt do so in the near future. But the context in which we do so is of even greater significance. We are here to emphasize our empowerment, women's empowerment, every woman's empowerment, political, albeit through representation, at all levels, parliamentary, local and global, through the enlargement of our own capacities, intellectual, professional, organizational, and a vast array of tools, skills, and expertise imperative to enable that empowerment. Um, when we talk about the uh, 2030 agenda, uh, the Sustainable Development Goals Advocate said, and I quote, one year ago, the world adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, 17 goals that have the potential to make us the first generation to put an end to extreme poverty, the most determined generation to fight inequality, and the last generation to be threatened by the effects of climate change. In a world where 3 million people still live in poverty, more than 65 million people are forced to leave their home countries, and where 71 million young people are unemployed, these goals are our chance to fix a broken system. We, the UN SDG advocates, are tasked with working by 2030 with the United Nations to see these goals achieved. We ask you to co-own this responsibility and take the substantial and specific actions required to create a better world for all. Then, end of quote, and then they go on asking the world leaders, government officials, business leaders, investors, civil society, and citizens to take some actions. And then they say, we urge you to make these goals and actions front and center. Together, we can achieve a breakthrough in sustainable development and leave no one behind. When we talk about no one behind, obviously, uh, we have to mean that, leaving no one behind. And there comes the three public policy concerns um, that I'm going to talk about. Ensuring equality. And in order to achieve that equality, we have to have empowerment of women, empowerment political, empowerment, economic, and social. And in order to do that, we have to have, have to change the mindset of both men and women. And education is a key factor. I want to also talk about violence against women, uh, which, again, I would say stems from inequality. Inequality in law, inequality in social status, again, mindset comes in. There are prejudices, there are practices which are discriminatory. Political and economic status of women, where religion also plays a role in emphasizing this lower status. And this whole mindset, when we talk about women immediately, uh, this social construct that women are vulnerable, they're helpless, um, uh, the issue of chastity, the talk about their honor, and then uh, we, we equate rape with ruining a woman's life. Uh, we equate, a society equates independence in some societies with a loose woman. Um, all these uh, social constructs. Um, so uh, the deconstruction of some of these uh, will have to be done. Um, in order to bring that equality. Then uh, we come to the issue of combating uh, climate change. Uh, for that, we need knowledge. We need to take responsibility. 
all of us, uh, and, and act. Act to mitigate, act to adapt. And for adaptation and mitigation both, uh, we would need technology and access to green technology, which for, for a country like Bangladesh, will we'll ask for transfer of technology. Um, and then for resources, which has to be easily accessible, easily accessible green fund, which is not so easily accessible, by the way. Women are disproportionately affected by climate change effects and, and other kinds of environmental uh, degradation. Uh, so in this context, what should be our development policies, plans, and programs look like? Would they be gender blind? Would they be gender neutral? Would they be gender specific? Or uh, would they be gender uh, responsive? Uh, development policies must deliver for, for women. And in order to ensure that, women must take part in the decision-making process. They can no longer be the target of development only. Uh, they must be the champions of development, the decision makers themselves. In Bangladesh, uh, women are uh, in, the, in the parliament, uh, in the executive, in uh, judiciary, media, civil society, in the institutions which are working to ensure uh, accountability, uh, like the National Human Rights Commission, National Information Commission, Election Commission, and so on and so forth. Uh, Bangladesh has, has made a remarkable uh, stride has has a remarkable success story in the field of women empowerment. Uh, we put non-discrimination issue to the forefront of our national development plan. We have been supporting women empowerment through adoption of policies, legislation, strategies, national action plans and programs. For example, the women empowerment issue has been given high prominence in the constitution of Bangladesh, domestication of the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, national strategy for accelerated poverty reduction, sixth and seventh five-year plan, national women development policy and child marriage restraint act and there are other legislations um, as well and moreover women's need and concerns have been incorporated in all sectoral plans uh, and and policies sdgs are the aspirational goals of the peoples of the world those uh, these goals were developed uh, through wide participatory process very democratic process unlike the unlike it's uh, the predecessor of the SDGs, the MDGs, which were uh, drawn up by experts. For the effective implementation of the SDGs also, there will have to be uh, participation by every quarter. Parliaments and parliamentarians can play a, a vital and, and significant role. Uh, all these three uh, policy, public policy concerns that I have talked about, um, ensuring equality, stopping violence against women, and combating climate change, will need to be addressed if we want uh, to achieve the SDGs by 2030. Um, there will have to be people's participation, especially women, in every step, um, in every step of this uh, way. In order to do this, we need to build institutions. We need to combat corruption, as we all know that uh, women su suffer disproportionately uh, because of corruption. Then bring systemic changes and deliver peace, justice, and equality. And who are in a position uh, to do all these things, uh, to connect? Uh, I, I believe that parliamentarians are. Um, we, the parliamentarians, are the people's representatives. We are elected by the people. We represent, uh, represent the people. We work for the people. And we are accountable, um, I would say, on a daily basis uh, for everything that we do. Um, our accountability is there to, uh, to the people. Our duties uh, and responsibilities are lawmaking, budgeting, oversight, and obviously public outreach. And through public outreach, we, we can ensure uh, participatory processes in all these other three duties and responsibilities. Uh, we can make participatory lawmaking happen. We can make participatory budgeting happen. We can make participatory um, oversight happen. And we can make all these gender responsive if we uh, act on it properly. And through that, we can actually deliver peace, justice, um, and equality. Uh, we, the parliamentarians, have a responsibility to support and monitor implementation of all 17 SDGs. Um, and we must work to safeguard the integrity of the Agenda 2030. But 
If we look at goal 16, which has special significance for the parliamentarians, um, goal 16 is sustaining peace and good governance. It aims to promote peaceful and inclusive societies for sustainable development, provide access to justice for all, and build effective, accountable, and inclusive institutions at all levels. Parliament is one of the institutions specifically responsible for ensuring accountability and inclusion. Therefore, over the next 13 years, we must play a leading role in realizing all facets um, of this goal. Uh, let us equip ourselves. We, we can't just say that we will do it. Um, and, and not equip ourselves or enable ourselves. Let us equip ourselves with knowledge, information, resources. Um, let us work together in preparing legal frameworks, creating tools and mechanisms, and build effective partnerships nationally, regionally, and internationally. And let us enable ourselves to become full and active partners in SDG implementation. I hope and trust that you'd share with me uh, the vision and goals that I have referred to through, through the SDGs, and I believe that our future is inevitable. I have every conviction that the future will give women the power to make laws, develop policies, and implement them, derive their benefits as co-equals and partners with men, and make this world we live in a fairer, more equitable, and just world. What is a threshold today will be a planet uh, where new frontiers of the rule of law without discrimination, peace without tension, and equal opportunities will prevail. Thank you. First, to introduce my party, Gabriela Women's Party, we take pride in being the only women's sectoral representative in the Philippine Congress. With this comes the challenge of making women's voices heard inside the halls of the House of Representatives and even outside of the policy-making arena. In a nation wherein over half of the 100 million population are women, mostly in agriculture, service sector, and informal jobs, there is a need for policies to be oriented towards the advancement of women's rights in the political, economic, and cultural spheres. Against the backdrop of worsening economic conditions due to neoliberal globalization and the rising incidence of gender-related violence, the challenge to push for pro-women and pro-people policies in Congress becomes even bigger. The situation does not get any better. As you may know, <laughs> under a new president who continues subscribing to the old neoliberal paradigm of foreign investment promotion and who indirectly encourages abuse of women. We have repeatedly uh, uh, denounced the chief executive for his pronouncements and policies and have even earned the ire of his loyal followers. On the three issues in the development and policy arena that impact on women in my country, basically the first one is on the sphere of uh, economy. Hoping to produce jobs, so I'll be talking about labor flexibilization. Hoping to produce jobs, our president has replicated his predecessor's framework of investing human capital to meet the demand of businesses which only answers for the global order for cheap labor. For more than three decades, flexible labor has made it easy for companies to hire and fire, and has made it harder for workers to demand security of tenure and higher wages. It is becoming clear that despite his campaign promise to end contractualization, our president is in fact continues to allow contractualization through other the Department of Labor order. It is labor flexibilization remains the biggest issue of Filipino workers, especially among women. According to the Bureau of Labor and Employment Statistics, the number of women employed in precarious work, which included contractual women workers and women in seasonal or temp temporary workers, had reached more than 2 million. Notorious implementers of contractual work are big companies in the wholesale, retail, food service, and manufacturing industries, where 75 to 85% of workers are women. 
women workers in retail and uh, in wholesale and retail trade consistently gain ground with now 1.26 million in number. Most of them work in, in sale of other goods in specialized stores, retail sale in non-specialized stores, retail of household goods and equipment, and a significant number of them work in large enterprises or superstores like shopping malls and groceries. And it's notable that among those malls are owned by the richest families in the country who also belong to uh, the richest in the whole world. Only 55% of the Filipino women are wage and salary workers. The rest are self-employed. 27% and unpaid family workers, 16% who usually work in farms and plantations. An estimated 1.6 million women are working in local private households as house help, cleaners and nannies among others. On top of this, more than half of the 12 million Filipino migrant workers are women who are working low quality jobs abroad and who are vulnerable to different forms of abuse. To share with you uh, how do we address this, Gabriela has filed a number of bills and resolutions, including a house bill which bans labor contractualization across all industries. Another one on the Occupational Safety and Health Bill, which has been approved by the lower house and is currently pending in the Senate. We have also sought congressional inquiries on several labor rights violations involving women workers, especially those that took place inside special economic zones, which, by the way, really no, um, has its own laws, no, which our uh, government uh, is, uh, can hardly touch. The second is a continuation of the problem uh, faced by Filipina, Filipino women. This is the corporatization of social services, privatization of social services. Amid declining wages and erosion of regular jobs, the current administration is pursuing the same track of privatization and corporatization of healthcare, housing, and other social services. Healthcare in particular is increasing, increasingly becoming the domain of the private sector with hefty allocations for health insurance and budget cuts for public hospitals, forcing them to resort to income-generating activities and public-private partnerships. In terms of housing, the national government has only allocated 624 million pesos for settlement projects, a tiny drop in the 3.767 trillion pesos proposed national budget. Key shelter agencies have admitted that the administration will continue to pursue a user's pay concept for housing, even as the housing backlog in 2016 stood at 5.7 million. For this reason, Gabriela has been very active in engaging the key departments and agencies on the issue of housing and healthcare, especially during the budget deliberations. We have pushed for the realignment of war spending and right-of-way infrastructure funds to direct to social services. We have also pushed for the awarding of ideal housing units nationwide to beneficiaries, which include informal settler families. I'm sorry, but I don't think I jive with the PowerPoint. <laughs> the third point is the persistent cases of violence against women and children. Uh, we have been unwavering uh, uh, in exposing and campaigning against violence against women and their children and other forms of abuses. For five consecutive years, we have played a key role in holding the uh, campaign uh, dubbed as One Billion Rising in the country, primarily through a cultural form, through dance. It is alarming that an increasing number of victims of rape in the country are minors. In 2016, 501 cases of statutory rape were reported to the Philippine National uh, Police, or a 64% increase from 2015. Cases of child prostitution also increased by 42% in 2016. This prompts us to step up efforts to push for interventions that will safeguard the rights of children and protect them from vulnerabilities and abuse. We have filed uh, 
various bills also. Also, like for example, the amendment to an existing law on uh, by anti-violence against women and their children to specifically define or include electronic violence against women and their children as an additional form. We have also filed amendments to the anti-rape law to underscore, underscore the essence of the crime, which is the lack of consent, and amendments to the anti-sexual harassment law to include peer-to-peer -peer abuses among other legislative intervention. But beyond our engagement in the House of Representatives, we believe that we should also recognize the power of women's collective action together with other sectors in pushing for meaningful and strategic changes in society. We have always asserted that addressing women's issues should never stand alone pursuit. It should always be situated within the broader picture of neoliberal globalization, which pushes the limits of capitalist accumulation at the expense of women and the people, preying on sexualized images of women to dispose commodities while at the same time reinforcing the feudal, patriarchal notions on women. Still, the challenge remains how to strengthen our assertion that it should be people over profit. And this should be the compelling reason to work within and outside of the parliament. Educating, organizing, and mobilizing women to rise up against policies that cling to failed neoliberal policies and encourage, and policies that encourage misogyny is but an urgent task in today's state of affairs. Thank you very much. So I now open the floor to audience. And like I mentioned, we will give all the panelists an opportunity to respond. Uh, could you just very briefly introduce yourself? Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ace. Uh, I'm from Singapore. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful uh, your speech just now. OK, uh, my name is Ace. I'm glad that there are some, if not many, women now in high position in all areas in the world. Being a Singaporean, I'm very uh, happy recently Singapore has its first and only female president in Singapore. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you. Thank you for the applause. My question is, <laughs> what incentives and promotions are there to encourage more women in all countries to come forward to contribute in the area of their passion and expertise? Thank you. In terms of politics, uh which I think reflects any profession, it's the same issues in any profession, is quite often it's an issue of empowerment and quite often how we approach women needs to be different to how we approach men. So, for example, in my political party, for a long time the party, you know, we had the same rules for men and women and thought that every, every woman who wanted to get involved could have the same opportunity as men. Um, but that's clearly not the case because culturally the organisation is set up you know, by men for men, and it can be quite an intimidating um, organisation. So a part of it is um, men and women making it visible and possible to actually go out and look for women and say, look, you know, this is something you can do. And quite often it's now we've realised the women who are in politics have to be much more visible uh, so that other women of any age can look at it and say, well, OK, well, maybe if she can do it, then I can do it as well. So it needs uh, a lot of mentoring and it needs more you know, outreach, but also support through the process. In politics, it's to understand how political parties work. So if you join a political party, you've got to have someone to show you uh, how to get into the networks, how the party election process works, how you get sponsored into positions, and then how you actually get winnable positions on tickets or on, um, you know, lists for, for elections. So it's quite a comprehensive issue. And just saying the rules are equal for men and women. Um, my party's waited 70 years and uh, in action, as I demonstrated, it's not a very viable strategy. They have to break a lot of barriers. I think to begin with, the barriers that we grew up with, uh, a woman has to break the barrier that is within herself. It's um, from the very childhood, all those barriers are created. 
and uh, society creates all those, family, uh, religion, everything. And to break out of that and then think, believe that she can do and uh, she can deliver, um, uh, that, that, is, uh, that is a very crucial step. And I think um, mentoring, as she mentioned, uh, is a very useful tool. Um, and then all the, the policy framework, the legal environment, all these things will have to be there. Um, and, and then parties uh, will have to uh, act as well. Uh, I'm very fortunate. I have a colleague here from, from the same party where our leader uh, is a, is a, a woman and uh, Bangladesh is, is actually a unique uh, example where the uh, prime minister is a woman, the leader of the opposition is a woman, the speaker of the parliament is a woman, and the leader of the uh, deputy leader of the house is also a woman. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some people do ask, where are the men? Well, they're everywhere, and, and we, are, we are only making some inroads, but they're already very jealous. We have to go ahead. I think uh, I will both, um, thank you, Ace, for the question. I, I think I have to um, include the framework. Uh, as you may know, the Philippines already had two women presidents. <laughs> and uh, those uh, years that the Philippines uh, were under uh, our women presidents, Economically, politically, and culturally, there is not much uh, forward development for women. So I think the framework should be um, regardless of gender, but of course, having women in the sphere of politics is one step forward for women to be part of the society's uh, dynamism. But anyway, uh, I think... Uh, the woman who would be participating in politics should be clear in representing the more marginalized sectors of society, be them men or women. So what I would like to say is that uh, the leaders, no? political uh, women who would be part of uh, political dyna dynamics of any country should be uh, carrying the utmost demands of the majority of the population. Thank you. I fund photography projects on Singapore issues. And the recent project that I did was on Singapore, Singaporean women. And we were all wondering, like, which one, right? So my question is one of the other side of the coin, of masculinity. A lot of the things that we're talking about starts me thinking about the crisis that we have in, in, in being men, in, in being masculine. And so I'm just, my question is one of where in policy would something like that sit and how can it be addressed? So that's question number one on masculinity because I think all the things that you're talking about, it's actually very hard to be a guy these days. I mean, to be honest. Um, so that's one. The second thing, the second project I did was on the elderly. And uh, we're, so, we're so good at talking about aging population and that most of it's going to be women, women are going to live longer, blah, 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 all that. So what is the policy that's, that ensures that a woman in her 70s and her 80s, and most likely living alone, what, what is the policy approach that should be taken? Do women age differently? Do, they, do, you, do countries need to have a policy where, for example, their pensions are higher? They get, a, 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 like in Singapore, we have a CPF thing, that the CPF contribution for women ought to be higher because they live longer. I mean, that, we've never done that before. So that is actually not exactly gender blind. It's really looking at gender, given the, what we already know today, which is that, yes, we're all aging and they're all gonna be women. So two very different questions. I think you're quite right. And I think this is part of the, the big social sort of evolution that we're now going through, is the fact is that women are now uh, in the workforce. They are, you know, we are seeking equality sort of on all fronts. But what does that mean, to, you know, what in that, that construct does it mean to be a woman and also what does it mean to be a man? And there does have to be some rebalancing because you can't have women 
expected to um, take all the burdens of, of family, children, parents, uh, and also work and economic security. So I don't have the answers, but it is one of these discussions we now have to have in a policy sense is how do you now make it just as okay for men to participate in family, you know, in, in parenting, in doing, you know, taking that share so they're fully equal at home, but also at the, in the workplace, but without taking away someone's femininity or their masculinity. So I don't have the answers, but that is something that we do have to, we do have, it's just a fact, to actually get to equality, we have to find a way to do that. Um, one of the things that I say sort of a lot is, in terms of workplace in the, in the military and politics, is um, as women sometimes I think um, we have to get over the fact um, that we are different. And I, I'm not sure if that makes sense or not, but I'll put it in context, is that um, yes, as women we do things differently quite often than men. We think differently, we make decisions differently, we speak differently, we have different sort of risk and, and other ways of doing things, but that's actually a really great thing. And as you see, as more women get into the boardroom, into politics, it does change the dynamics and how things are done. And I, that's something uh, almost hard to describe, but just because we do things differently, it doesn't mean in a value sense it's any worse. And in fact, quite often it means we do things differently, but we do it better. And it's how do we actually do that without losing our gender identity as well? Um, because sometimes when women go into, and I, I found this going into the military, is that you don't realise it, but you start adopting more masculine traits and ways of speaking and thinking and doing things. And it's quite liberating when you finally get to a point in your professional life where you can actually be a soldier, but also be a woman as well. Talk like a woman, think like a woman, and look like a woman. <laughs> so there's no answer there, I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> I don't think we've got there. The society, the way uh, it looks at a woman, um, and in, in leadership positions, um, in the past, women, uh, even now, in, in the boardrooms, in, in, in military, in other places, uh, women try to behave like men, and because uh, uh, then they become more acceptable. Um, in order to be accepted, they, uh, they um, adopt that, that kind of a persona. Um, but I, I also believe that it's great to be a woman, and just as it it's it's great to be a man i'm i'm sure uh, so but the way we are we are now uh, slowly uh, but surely we are becoming um, okay with being a woman anywhere we are i think men should also um, uh, have that opportunity i think still uh, men uh, like all those ideas about men never cry or uh, men don't uh, i mean it's uh, holding a child and doing all those things with, with, I mean, doing the chores in the house or helping in the family, I mean, that's not manly. I mean, they should shed all those ideas um, because um, it, these are all, again, the social constructs and, and we have to get out of these and, and uh, just, be, just be ourselves and we have our strong points as they have their, men have their strong points. Um, it's, it's nature. And uh, so we, um, we behave differently. Uh, but as she said, uh, definitely not, a, not, a, not something to be looked down upon. It's, uh, we behave differently because we are physiologically we're different. Our hormones are different. So we, uh, <laughs> we react differently. And that doesn't mean that um, we are any less. Um, so, uh, if, if we were any less, if women were not that necessary, uh, then uh, the nature would have created only men. <laughs> Why women? <laughs> and, and not just that, just look, uh, I mean, I feel actually, I, um, you might call it uh, a contradiction. All the most difficult task, I think the most difficult task for humankind I would say, as a physician, I would say, is a childbearing and giving birth to a child. If the nature has given that responsibility to a woman, obviously the nature depended more 
on 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 woman. Uh, firstly, I am not against men. <laughs> uh, actually, I think um, my appreciation to the question of Lily is on the existing vulnerability of women because of the existing machismo um, or attitudes uh, towards uh, women that uh, make us more vulnerable. And I think the worst uh, attitude is to take women as sex objects. Basically, I don't see any problem with regard to uh, equal rights to men and women, uh, or women who opt to uh, exercise their whatever sexuality or choice they may want to choose, no? Because human rights should be for all. No, men, women, uh, lesbian, gay, or whatever. I think the bottom line is how do the existing social institution uh, promote, promote a culture where uh, the basic premise is on the respect for human rights? Because as mentioned by my colleagues here, uh, the society, the institutions in the society that we have, no? From family, especially media, academe, and of course, a uh, state who also has its responsibility to uh, put forth uh, policies that will eradicate no? system programs that will make women more vulnerable to various forms of oppression. So I think the challenge is to both men and women. But since we are at the forefront of the cultural problem, I think uh, a, women, a strong women's movement uh, should be one of the issues uh, or actions uh, that, we, that is a challenge. And uh, I think I, uh, we have already accepted. I agree with uh, our speaker that these are social constructs, the masculinity, these are mental models that when we were born in the family, there's already these social constructs and these mental models. However, we also have to understand, so it's continuous education uh, of our men and women uh, on sexual orientation, gender identity and expression. Our rule, the rule of the thumb always is whatever the person says, if he or she is a woman, a man, how she feels that, or how he feels, how he looks at himself, uh, how he identifies himself, that, then that is what, what he is or what she is. So I think uh, that's where the masculine, because it's possible I am, for example, I'm masculine, but I am a woman. Um, and um, I, I would like to also say that I, I, I got married to my wife in uh, like how many months ago, and there will always be questions. So who's the man? You know, when you go in the in the Philippines, it's still taboo. Who's the man? What, you know, um, and who does these jobs? Who who does the carpentry or who does the grocery, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's it's a constant. Um, they have to see. If not icons, they have to see leaders who are at home and at ease with um, discussing uh, all these concerns on LGBT and on SOGI uh, concerns, and who are um, who are learned or who knows uh, who knows how, how, how these things uh, goes and how to educate uh, correctly, especially the youth, because the youth um, in in so many fora they would always say, so where does the that places us. I'm trans man. I'm trans women. I'm I'm a trans woman, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, for us uh, women leaders, most especially, we have so much uh, a responsibility. And um, I also agree with our speaker that as public officers, we are accountable on a daily basis. So yeah. My question concerns your thoughts on the quota system for women in decision-making positions. Because the debate currently that's going on in several countries is whether or not we should impose a quota system in uh, parliamentary, uh, parliamentary uh, what you call it, balloting uh, or candidates. Uh, and then uh, maybe this in addition and in conjunction with the first question, what is your advice for young women who intend or have thoughts about joining politics and uh, leadership roles? Um, my particular area of interest is criminal justice policy. And um, I wanted to throw out the idea that not sometimes 
equality demands treating people differently. And um, in the criminal justice context, I'm interested particularly in the issue of women who are incarcerated. That's the fastest growing population of prisoners in the United States. And I, I was curious what steps are being taken to uh, meet the unique needs of women who are incarcerated because their needs are not the same as males. With regard to the situation of uh, women prisoners, I think there is really a big problem. Because in the Philippines, uh, women prisoners, we have so many cases of women prisoners who are used by the uh, police officers no, for sexual pleasure or, and even for uh, continuing uh, criminal acts other than them uh, directly abusing the women. Uh, with regard to policy, I think uh, thorough a thorough reorientation of the criminal justice should really be undertaken by all governments to first to recognize that there is really a big uh, need for women prisoners in as much as they are the most vulnerable. So at this point in time, for example, in our country uh, as a legislator, what we do right now are first uh, during hearings, no, where we where agencies uh, representing the police and the justice uh, agencies, we push through with questioning how much appropriation do they plan to appropriate for uh, doing repairs or even the building, no to make sure that women prisoners are protected and also their medical needs and specific needs as women. But of course, that's all are still, uh, I would say, very tactical. But strategically, I think uh, the challenge is on the general justice system that we have because it's so slow. I mean, there are detainees, uh, which uh, women detainees who have been in, in detention without even hearing for as long as 12, 14 years. And you can imagine, no? Uh, the torture, mental, physical, and the social costs that impact also on their families. So the challenge is still there, but I am glad that some steps have been, uh, have been done and uh, still will be doing. Different part, in different parts of the world, different quota systems are uh, now in place. But in, in countries where uh, women are lagging behind, um, we have seen that uh, it works to have, have a quota. Um, in Bangladesh, we have an overall quota where um, there are 50 reserved seats for women. Uh, and these are um, the political parties, they nominate their candidates pro rata, on a pro rata basis. Um, but we also feel that maybe it could be better if there were quotas um, imposed on the po political parties and political parties would be required to uh, field so many women, percentage of women. Uh, that could be a better model. But I don't know, I mean, uh, many different uh, kinds of uh, experimentations are going on all over the place, but quotas do help. And we have now 20% women in our parliament because of the quotas. Otherwise, we would have 6-7% um, uh, at the most uh, through the direct elections. Uh, so quotas do work. And, and there are different uh, kinds, as I said. Then what should the young women do? I mean, young women... Um, she talked about mentoring, we talked about mentoring. As I said, breaking, breaking the barrier within yourself, that's the first step. And then um, look, for the, look for the political party that you want to join and, and knowing fully well why you are joining, what you would like to do and um, uh, knowing exactly what your expectations are and then uh, there has to be training, there has to be, and, and political parties will, um, around the world, I think um, they're trying, but uh, 
the environment is still, I mean, politics is still dominated by men. Uh, so the um, environment within the political parties, conducive envi environment for young women to grow, um, that is not really there in many parties. Uh, fortunately, in our party, we have that environment. That is why there are so many women in our party, but um, not everywhere. So, uh, but women have have to come uh, forward and then uh, cross the hurdles. For women prisoners, we have, I mean, it's not the ideal condition, far from it. Uh, there are all these uh, things about safe custody and sometimes uh, women are uh, given um, uh, to sent to the shelters run by NGOs, sometimes to rehabilitation centers, but especially women prisoners who are with small children or who give birth uh, in the prisons. I mean, it is very difficult and, and it's still um, undergoing many kinds of reforms. Um, it's, it's still far from the ideal. A lot of it is intergenerational poverty, uh, violence, drug abuse, welfare dependence. And uh, there's an over-representation of women in that category who are, um, are incarcerated um, in Australia. Uh, to a zero to the quotas. Um, I don't think that... I've seen quotas work in a lot of different countries and I've talked to women in a number of countries about that. I think quotas in themselves, they're just um, a tool. They're just a tool to achieve an objective. And in some circumstances, uh, in, you know, in many countries, there is just no other way for women to break through in politics. So I think that's actually very important. But the bigger question is, is what do you actually want to achieve? Uh, because obviously you don't want quotas forever. And you want to, the cultural change in the society and in the parliament um, and in the community to actually stick so that when you take the quotas away, um, they, they're maintained. And sometimes you see if there's no quotas or if they're removed, then because the behaviour and the thinking hasn't changed, then you just revert back. Um, back. And practically, uh, a lot of women don't want to be seen, they want to be seen to be there on their own merits and don't want to be seen as a quota or, or a special representative. But again, it's how you deal with that when you're there and how the system supports you. And you need that critical mass of women. Um, I've just, just one thing on that. I was recently, um, I spent a lot of time in Papua New Guinea and they have a particular challenge with, uh, with women. And so the election before last, they had three women and it was the three women who actually was very strongly against bringing in quotas. Now, all three lost for different reasons and there haven't been women coming in, in behind them. So women have got to work together, they've got to support each other and to do what they can to get more women. It's not a criticism of those those women, please, but um, it's you do need that critical mass, but you need the cultural change and that's the more important thing. In many societies, um, people assume that women can't become um, parliamentarians, you, women can't become, uh, can't come on their own. Um, but when they see uh, women uh, coming through quotas or through elections and coming and performing, um, that helps in changing the mindset. And also women who come through the quotas, uh, they don't come just because uh, they have some connections or something. They come because of their qualities. I mean, uh, political parties also try to uh, uh, put forward uh, the best that they have. Uh, maybe they couldn't bring them through the elections uh, because elections, in, in especially in our part of the world, it involves money, muscle, many other things. And, and um, sometimes it's just difficult still, uh, given the uh, social conditions. So women come through quotas and then they, uh, they uh, shine. And, and then they do, they, their mindset also changes and then they uh, opt to go for elections. So I think quotas um, have a beneficial and effect. In Australia uh, and the but U at some point, uh, I'm sure. Yeah. Well, in <laughs> Australia and the UK, is the more... Women actually make very good politicians. They make very good, in terms of the attributes, more likely to listen, uh, be more responsive to community needs and to social needs, um, and also very good you know, in, in harder portfolios as well. But you need enough women um, there so that people can see that a politician doesn't just have to look like a man in a suit and tie <laughs> or have all men in suit and ties because that's not representative. So sometimes you do need that so people can say, oh, 
well, actually, she's a pretty good, oh, yeah, she's actually pretty good. Well, give her a go. Uh, as researchers, we face quite a lot of challenges. Data is not disaggregated by gender. Uh, projects uh, uh, give the illusion that the outcomes can be reached without having a gender lens. Uh, or issues are difficult to research about because of intangibility, such as rise of fear and security by women. So my question is, in that context, given the challenges, and from what your experience has shown, what are some of the areas you think research can be helpful, which so far you have seen very uh, little about? Which areas would you recommend or suggest researchers to focus on with a gender? First of all, uh, while the first world is fighting over the fact that, you know, whether women are, uh, or men are supposed to be equally working at home or not, uh, the, the developing world is right now fighting for particularly women to enter to, into the workforce, the barrier. So I would like to discuss you know, how, would we, how would we, you know, uh, balance the two. Uh, second um, is that, you know, you talked about visibility. I mean, I've just heard that, you know, we've got the leader of the opposition as a woman and uh, there's the president of a woman also and, uh, and everybody else. But my observation as a woman is that more women who are on, in the leadership role, less is the policies that are made for the woman. Uh, that's my observation. We in Pakistan had a woman prime minister also. Uh, but uh, as, far as, the, as far as the visibility is concerned, there was a recent campaign on harassment against women that, that was on social media that was called Me Too. And a lot of women came out and say, talked about the harassment that, they, that had taken place. And I think a lot of other women joined in. So I think that visibility is important in, in the third world. But once you become visible, then you are more susceptible to attacks. So, you know, the character uh, attacks become more frequent. So if you, if you can actually fight that, then you can become a very competent politician or any, any, or any other a person in any other field, a leader in any other field. And third of all, I'd, I'd just like to ask one question. Each of your countries have, have done a lot for women. I would like to ask if they have, have they actually done uh, some kind of uh, concrete work as far as violence against women is concerned. I mean, for example, in Pakistan, we've made violence against women's centers where, you know, where uh, women can actually call and, you know, report and she'll be given legal and uh, uh, all kinds of help. But uh, the fight was, obviously, the men fought uh, in, the nation, in the assemblies about the fact that, you know, the religious factor brought in, was brought in and the men were required to wear a band and which they denied. So what are, we, we had those implementing problems. So I would, I would like to know what actually are you doing against the violence that takes place at home and at workplace? I think the first thing that we're starting to get some uh, tr traction in Australia on this is we actually talk about it. We actually don't just ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist, um, but actually make it visible so that if anybody sees it, you report it, you check, you check on someone, and then you can go through. There are law enforcement, uh, you know, criminal sort of activities, there's a lot more support for women and their children. And sometimes it's actually the men who are, you know, it's not just women, it's sometimes it is the men, um, but it's mostly women. So we're, we're making improvements, but we're still, it's still, if the women and children are subject to ongoing domestic violence and physical violence, they, all, they still have much longer term, you know, worse outcomes longer term. Because we take the women out of the home and the children out of home, and the man lets to, lets to keep their job, their house. And so some way we've got to find a way so that it's not the women and children who suffer long term from that. It's not easy, but it's a long journey. Well, uh, to answer your question, which area? I would say if it's one area, it has to be the decision-making process. Um, look at that area with, uh, with the gendered lens uh, because that's the critical area. Uh, that would make all the um, difference. And then for uh, women leaders, does not automatically mean policies conducive to women's development. Um, but it's more likely to be that way. Uh, so it's, it's, it's just not automatic. Um, and, and we do have one-stop crisis centers. We have laws uh, against violence against women. We have uh, laws against domestic violence. 
Uh, and we have the uh, one-stop crisis centers. We have the um, call centers. Uh, and we have the DNA labs, uh, all these things in place. But still, like everywhere in the world, it's still going on. Actually, in the Philippines, we already have what you may call uh, progressive laws. Uh, with regard to violence against women. But, of course, in practice and in implementation, we, we saw that uh, still, no, um, the existing laws are not uh, being uh, implemented at the ground level. And uh, we see that one of the problems is that education and public information is still lacking, especially at the government level, no, how to... Uh, uh, bring the information down the line. From our end, um, we also would like to uh, make amendments to the existing laws. For example, the one I shared before, we, I, I would say that rape law, um, the anti-rape law now in the Philippines uh, has uh, improved in the sense that before, it was a crime against chastity. But when the women's movement for, for it, uh, fought for it to be amended, and it, was na, uh, it is now a crime against person. But what we would like to amend now is, uh, it's very hard no? for rape victims to prove that the sec, the, what happened to them was not um, against their will. It is as if, no, uh, if you don't have the bruise uh, or the physical... Um, what do, marks, so you accepted, no? So therefore, it is not rape, no? So we would want to change that uh, and uh, put that into legislative amendment. And for the last uh, man who, uh, for, for the last uh, question, at what level? I think at all levels, but we have to um, cut down all the barriers, which uh which is economic, political, and of course the overarching is, is still cultural. So the challenge is for everyone. <laughs> Thank you. So please again join me in thanking our panelists.